the ABR Reading Series. Our honored guest, Jake Adam York. Thanks to all the, the people named Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it made it really easy to remember who you were talking to. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to all of you. Thanks to ABR um, and Victoria and, and General Texas. Um, I'm having a good time. So thanks for being here. I understand some of you may be here from a high school. And um, I want to read, I want to start off by reading a, a newer poem that remembers something from my high school. I was the mascot of my school, the, the high school mascot, and our mascot was a panther. And so this poem is called I was a Black Panther in high school. <laughs> because I was the only one who showed, they gave me the black polyester PJs with the footies and mitts and the two-inch nap funked by a dozen bodies and the foam head with a yawn I could see through as I raced behind the cheerleaders to make my three-quarter somersault to slide on my tail through the dewing grass to do daring with a yellow jacket or a devil dressed like a Civil War colonel. Goatee, hair, white as my plastic eyes. No one thought was weird because, like the panther, it had always been there, hanged in the closet of the mind, easy as a jersey for anyone to don. And because our riots were two decades past and our postcard lynching another 60 years, and Atlanta and Memphis and Montgomery three hours away like Lounsboro, where the Panthers, backed into their corners, started fighting back. Far enough beyond the lights, no one thought of Huey P. or Stokely when I patrolled the sidelines, dark arms waving to wake the whole white town to make them raise their fists and scream. All right, now I want to take you further back. And this poem kind of doesn't work unless I tell you that... Um, I was born in 1972. Self-portrait as a moment in 1963. Supper's late, and my mother sprawls before the console, half watching gun smoke. Alabama history spread before her, though school's almost out for summer, and the chicken's almost fried to that perfect crisp. Then it's over, credits stamped over final stills, and the show gives way to news a minute or two of film from Birmingham, not an hour south, where police are turning dogs on kids as young as she, spraying them with hoses until they fall, the water she isn't watching curling like smoke in the air. My grandmother flicks the switch, and they're gone. They eat in quiet, each cutting a breast or thigh into steam, forking beans or macaroni until the plate's blank faces shine again. This is years before she'd meet my father, before I'd come to that table, that food, that room. There's a silence here I want to scratch away so I can see what's underneath, what they don't recall. I want to turn someone's head, my grandfather's maybe, or mother's, back toward the TV, where the tube's still fading, the ghost of that scene on the edge of that room. I want someone there to see and remember so I can leave and go back into the future, not history, not yet. This is sort of a way of explaining this project that one of the Jeffs talked about, uh, which is a, a long-term kind of life project to write a poem in memory of all of the martyrs of the civil rights movement. And hopefully you've heard of this concept, the martyrs of the movement. Um, but you may not know, even if you've heard of it, how it has changed over the last decade. In 1989, the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery uh, worked to erect a monument that had the names of 40 men, women, and children murdered between 1955 and 1968. Uh, men, women, and children whose murders marked pivotal moments in the civil rights movement, either in the national scene or in their local communities. And as a result of that monument being built, a lot of stories that had sort of been forgotten or not really thought very much about came to light. And so now this list of martyrs 
is actually more than 120 people's names long. Um, and so I started out with the idea of writing the 40 poems, but then I said, well, now I have to write 126 poems at least. Um, and so I said, we'll just, we'll just take the whole life to do that. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into it, and it is complicated work, but it, it involves in some ways kind of going back in time. I wanted to read a, a slightly longer poem, a little more meditative poem, that actually kind of explains how this work is done um, and what I think it means. Um, and this is a poem that is interested in the murders of two men in New Orleans in 1967, Aaron Lee and Joseph Thomas, two men whose murders have never been solved. This poem is called Shore. Here you are only epitaphs. Names, dates on the list I carry and unfold when the light seems quiet enough. You were just this spill of a city, no ward, no neighborhood, as if that last place can't be touched, as if the line had slipped through some scar the water <coughs> multiplied, then forgot. That water's everywhere, reaching through the trees in the steam of afternoon, the smell of everything and that tremble in it, the afterward of that last reflection. Somewhere you are burned on an inch of film, your names, your faces, maybe your last addresses, places where I could ask again. So the reels unwind in a library's dim, old bulbs, dirty light scumming the emulsion's oil, that chemical sprawl, that rainbow the dead always leave behind. Aaron Lee, you are a forgotten mile in New Orleans East, an alleyway of scrapyards and boxcars and derelict homes, trailer parks now <coughs> laced as curtains where the flood has grazed, a place even the maps might forget. The water stays between the lilies and cattails blades, between the gravel knuckles and the tar. The water stays keeping that place where you last touched the earth where you rose up biblical in air before gravity remembered you and called you home again. And now it keeps the rest, the car that launched you, that drove away, the friend thrown too into the reeds, <coughs> and even the house just west of here where you never arrive, abandoned as a name no one answers to. And you, Joseph Thomas, you are an empty lot a field behind a chain link fence where the St. Bernard Project used to be, where one night you walked into the yard and slumped into the grass as if sleep suddenly found you, and you collapsed under its weight and lay down where the dew would cover you. Hours later, someone would pull back that blanket and find you cold, your last breath gelled in your philtrum, inarticulate <coughs> ink the bullet spilled. Hours later, someone would turn you over in that yard which is not here anymore in this field between Hamburg and Gibson that has forgotten everything but a single tree. Each doorway, each window, each lot line and walkway, even that place where the sniper stood, which could be right where I'm standing now. There are no answers. There is no one to ask. An ice cream truck sings its way down Gentilly's abandoned mile and three bulldozers ply St. Bernard's vacant ground, but no one stops. And downtown where the smell of the river's even stronger, a librarian files the reels again and the steel drawers click shut. I have little more to write beside your names on this list of martyrs, of people to be pulled back through the glass of history. This list where you stand for everyone who had a killing, but not a killer for everyone who simply disappeared, who walked out as if into air, taken into a fog's unknown hands, leaving nothing but a name, a date, and that fear, constant as water, that anyone could be next. I fold the page again and peel my shoes from the mud. Everything smells, as it always did, of mud, of river and lake and live oak. Everything's reaching up like that one great hand in the middle of the rubbled lots, like the fingers of the sago in a ditch on the edge of town, the way it always does 
trying to hold something that might rise and be gone. <coughs> Whenever you touch the earth, it can grab at your heels, and you can look back at the wells your walking's made and watch as the water touches, then fills them in. Okay, now I'm going to read a series of shorter, shorter poems. I'm going to read two poems that have the same title. They're about two men who um, are linked in history and in place. One, um, one man was murdered by a Mississippi State congressman in uh, 1961 in broad daylight, but like no one saw anything. And um, a couple of years later, the one person who actually was there and thought about testifying and was deciding to tell his story, um, he was murdered as well. And the town is called Liberty, so these, these two poems are called At Liberty. September 21st, 1961. Everyone will say he drove to the gin with a truck full of cotton, so he drives to the gin and gets in line. And everyone will say the congressman pulled in behind him, so he gets out yelling, Herbert Lee, I'm not messing with you this time. And his affidavit will say Lee had a tire iron, and there are no photographs, so there is a tire iron. And since the congressman will say Lee swung at him, his hand will grasp the iron under the tangle of his own dead weight. And the congressman will leave and will not see him again. So he just lies there bleeding, and no one will touch him. So for a time, he is just a story, or a huddle of starlings, or crows, or a cloud of bottle flies that might explode and disappear, until the witnesses can, can say he's there, and an undertaker can come with a hearse from the next county over, and then he is dead. And the congressman can tell his story. So Herbert Lee will rise from his coffin and swing his iron. And the FBI can come and make him into evidence. But someone will have roped him into his grave. So there is no photograph. And no one sees the cotton bowl wicking blood. So there is no bowl. Only a clear white negative in the dark. And a paper that slowly fills with flies. At Liberty. January 31st, 1964, Lewis Allen. The morning train is turning like a compass needle. Now the night has folded all its schedules in the stands of pine and cedar, all its innumerable wings. And tomorrow he will be gone from the lumberyards and the farmhouse windows that semaphore like televisions and the vacant hands of Herbert Lee and the killer and the quiet of having never seen a thing. Quietly now, while his truck is idling, dark decides from all the county's limbs, shattering into birds that shatter, then collapse to his skin. Beaks, lace, eardrum, and eardrum, his cheeks, his tongue, their obsidians needling for what he's seen, what he would surely tell, so he won't have to see it, so he won't have to whisper it even once, ever again. Now, those sort of poems have been kind of core of this project for many years. And I was spending a lot of time thinking about the future of this project a couple of years back. Um, and it kind of explained to somebody why I wanted to keep working on it. And I said, it's, it's interesting and disturbing to me that I have this list of these 126 martyrs. And the only the reason I know about them is because they died. Some of them I know about their lives because they were well-known people like Medgar Evers, who were very important to their communities. But some of them are so unknown, so anonymous, that we don't even actually have photographs of them. These are people who lived so far, um, so far out of the economic life of anything that they didn't even ever have the money to have their photograph taken, which tells you that they also were not, um, they didn't have adequate schooling and things like that. Um, and as I was saying this to a friend of mine, I thought, this is why I wanted to do this. I wanted to recover their names, but I also wanted to recover their lives to the extent that that's possible. Um, and so I started to make a change. And so I want to read three uh, short, newer poems that are, 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 are linked 
They're all about the murder of a, a man named John Earl Reese, who was 16 years old in 1955 uh, in Longview, Texas, or outside of Longview, Texas. Uh, he and his cousins and, and siblings were celebrating the opening of a brand new school for uh, African-American students outside of Longview, and some Klansmen came by and shot up the place where they were dancing, and John Earl Reese died. The community um, outside of Longview is called Mayflower, so this poem is called Mayflower. Before the bird's song, you hear its quiet, which becomes part of the song and lives on after, struck notes bright and silent. As the rooms damp, wallpaper and wall muffling the high cicadas whine, mumbling talk from another room hangs like the thought of a roof in the midst of rain long after the joists have been brought down. So the quiet, syllables crowded, full throats once the talkers have gone away, and a young man's voice becomes a young man's silence, all he did not say which nothing keeps saying in the empty room between the pines that hold the quiet of the song he cannot sing, the sound of a room without sound in the middle of what anyone can hear. If you go to Longview looking for Mayflower, that's kind of what you see. The, the, a portion of that, um, of that cafe where they were dancing is still there, but it's mostly empty space. And that's kind of more of that older kind of elegy that I was writing. Um, and I started thinking about ri writing that poem again and kind of capturing that last moment, that last moment of life. Here's a, here's a young man who is dancing, who is celebrating. And can I get close enough, can I get far enough back in imagination or whatever to recapture some part of that moment? So I wrote this poem, which is uh, constructed as a loop and so at the end of the poem, it rounds back to the beginning, and it, and it, and it goes on uh, in perpetuity. And it's called Cry of the Occasion. <clears throat> so loud it fills the valleys of even the fingers, smeared into a kind of quiet, the everything you can't hear but hear through, the music, everybody in the room still moving, the beat gone erratic as a bat, juking the pines and chimney swifts toward grace notes of nourishment over the lake. I see in the perpetual lapping of water in the locked groove of some cousin's record I put my finger to pull back the arm, but it shivers toward the moon, thrown like a penny from the engine's wheel, like the sound of a penny thrown from the glass, calling my name louder than I've ever heard this part before. A bird whose name so long has never finished saying it holds me waiting for the end so I can say something a little more blunt like thunder, a finger through bone peeling back the husk of the voice opening like a bird called into the wild, answering, but like the bird I have not even seen, this music goes on forever. The stars blur the bottleneck against the bridge, swallows abandoned for the water, cutting into the bank where I keep trying to move the needle to cut my answer into the night. I have to catch the bird and slide it against my neck. I have to carve the guitar from the dead head beneath the lake and all its waves to sing so loud it fills the valleys. Okay, so that's going on forever. I have that early LG, which I did, it's all silence. That's in silence. That poem's going on as a perpetual loop in the background. Hopefully you memorized it while I was reading it. And so you can uh, hang on to that. And then this poem is kind of a re, in some ways a rededication, a, re a reconceptualization of my, of my work. And also a rededication, um, trying to get into a place where these, these lives or these moments are at, at the center of the work I'm doing rather than their deaths. And this poem is called Inscription for Air. <coughs> not for the wound, not for the bullet, powers pale cowardice, but for you, the three full syllables of your name, John Earl Reese. We hold whole as a newborn by the feet. And so for the cry, the first note, the key of every word to follow, the timbre, the tone, the voice that could sing Nat King Cole's If I May and slow dance the flip side, the blossoms fallen like a verdict to the jury's lips. 
not to the blood or the broken glass or the spider's silken jukebox wires in a junk man's shed, but the finger's heat still on the dime when it slides to the switch, the lamp on the platter, the groove that tells the needle what to say and the pine boards of the cafe floor, once moved by the locust's moan, now warm as a guitar's wood, revived with all the prayers of song. Amens that flame when a blues turns bright, not for what was lost, but what was lived, what is written here in the night and vinyl, in the air, for the bead of sweat at the hair's deckel, the evening star in the trees, soda pop sugar wild on your tongue, and for the tongue telling Saturday night something of Sunday morning, fluent as a mockingbird, and for the hand that opens as if in praise, as if in prayer, asking for another to fill it there, for the smile and for the smile of skin behind the ear where love might lip its name, for you, if we may, pull back the arm and start this music once again. My wife always says, when I'm working on these poems, she says, you always take me to the nicest places, um, which is ironic, of course. <laughs> where did you go on vacation? We went to see where some teenager was murdered in 1955. <laughs> Not the sort of thing that is the story that you want to be telling about your vacation. So I always take her someplace she wants to go after we do that. So this may not be where you want to go, but we're going to kind of pull out of, pull out of that pull out of that place and do something a little different. So um, I realize as I'm reading these, I've read a lot of, I've read poems with a lot of obsolete technology in them, like record players, microfilm machines, et cetera. So I'm just going to keep going. So I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a poem about a, about a record player. Um, I'm 40. I think anybody who's my age or older uh, remembers that, you know, your father had a, a record player. And you couldn't touch that thing. You couldn't get anywhere near it. You couldn't breathe next to it. Uh, you had a basketball in the house, and a record player was going. Like you had to get that thing out of there. Okay, because that needle apparently cost the family's entire life savings. Um, my father was no exception. But many years later, he decided to get rid of his record player because he said he always hated records. Always hated records. He liked CDs because they, you know, more indestructible. So he gave me the record player. I inherited it. And I want to write a poem about inheriting the record player. And so one of the albums I like to listen to is this uh, Thelonious Monk album, uh, Monk's Music. And there's a song on it called Epistrophe, which just means uh, epistrophe is a figure of speech where the end of something gets kind of repeated in a pattern. And in that song, Epistrophe, there are two figures that he repeats over and over. So this, this poem is written with a story about my dad and a story about Thelonious Monk kind of mashed up together and playing with each other. So it's called Epistrophe. The sleeve sighs from the jacket, the record from the sleeve. The needle takes its breath. I know what's next, the horns, the hymns that spiral back to silence after the room fills with the sound of another room, the sound of steel as it fills the groove. Tonight, it's Monk's music, a record that begins in evening and then turns back to twilight. It pleads, abide with me, and then demurs, well, you needn't, as dark rewinds. Halfway back to crepuscule, it stops to ask for another hand, and I have to rise to turn the record as the room remembers the room it used to be. I have to raise the needle I couldn't touch, once too delicate for my hand, needle that had to wait for my father's. He'd stand some nights in silence, smoke his only word, then reach and take the arm, or he'd stand and take a breath, sigh of the sleeve in the jacket, cough the door, and be gone. Like those movies, like those nightclub films where Monk stands from the piano, turns his quiet waltz, then walks off the stand, 20, 30 minutes gone, the side men keeping time while he works the night shift at the furnace. I have to wait for morning or evening again to hear the other side. Monk has to stay in his child red wagon while the stars spin through the pines. Now I turn the music back, turn it over as light eases back into the sky. Dad wakes the blanket, the amp, the smell of solder, smell of oil instead of iron, 
twilight instead of twilight. Then the room is young again. The smoke, the silence, the stars years away until dusk raises its hands from the keys. Then the needle gasps and I stand. I reach his hand on mine and breathe again. All right, so here's another record-related poem. This, this, this contains a small moment. This, so I'll read this poem and then read another poem. This poem is going to move very, very fast. I'm just going to tell you a couple things before I get into this. Um, well, I'm just going to tell you one thing. The moment on a vinyl record I love the most is this moment on Sun House's uh, Library of Congress sessions. In 1941, Sun House was recorded by Alan Lomax, who went out into Mississippi with this giant machine and recorded people like where they lived. They didn't go to the studio. They just recorded them you know, on the sidewalk or at the train station. And Lomax records Sun House at this train station in the middle of nowhere. And right in the middle of this one track, something weird happens, like the time uh, of the recording begins to drag, like there was something wrong with the tape. Sun House hears the train coming, and he changes the, the, the tempo at which he's playing in order to play in time with the train. And so that's in the middle of this poem, which is a, in part about um, my hometown and about my dad, who was a steel worker. So there's a bunch of stuff in here that is not going to make any sense, but these are like sort of capsule histories of my hometown. Um, and so just look up Gadsden, Alabama on Wikipedia, and you'll find that none of this has been recorded there because these are the things that no one wants to remember. So. This is a poem also written as a letter to Terence Hayes. So it's called Letter to be Read by Furnace Light. I am on the wrong street in the wrong part of town following the chain of a poem in which the wrong music is on the radio in all the imagined rooms. And it isn't even a radio, but a record player. And the disc is Sun House's 1941 session, and probably the label should look like the harp in the mouth of the Stella or the welds of a locomotive's wheels, because this is the music of steel, music you'd burn down mountains for, music heated past any man's ability to see, to the bright of pure iron that will call your blood from your veins, your breath from your lungs, so the iron is blown stronger than ever. Steel you could roll, steel you could spin to a filament, a fiber brighter than pulpwood or cotton. This is the music of a body quoting back the machine and a body exceeding it. This is John Henry music John Henry can't sing, so it's been handed down from the rail and the steam case and the coffin. This is wake-up music, which has walked me back to the Mississippi gallery near the place where the dark birds gather in the lake edge oaks, birds the color of vinyl where Sun House hears the train before it comes, before Lomax knows, before the microphone knows, and then it's the locomotive's music I'd hear each night before my father followed it to the furnace. Steel rails humming, the hot metal smell handed down like music from that place where everyone's blood is called by the same hungry fire. I am not going to say the furnace light falls on everyone the same because we know when Andrew Jackson or John Coffey watches Tallahassee burn, it's the same fire, but not the same heat the Choctaw feel. And because this is the town where Bunk Richardson swung from the railroad trellis, where Bill Moore was shot on his integration walk, the town where Miss Mary Hamilton insisted the court call her by her last name too, and this is the town split in two by the murder of a preacher by a Klansman and the murder of a storekeeper by a neighborhood teen, which is what I imagine my father and Red are talking about this one night as the heat runs out and the exhaust gas burns its ghostly blue over the furnace, dying everything deeper than the denim they wear against the fire, which they know may become the fire, which is what they're working out. What my father repeats when he comes home and I am still in bed. And this is how I take part in this music, turning around them as the record turns in the light of the quartz lock. And Sunhouse puts his pulse into the strings and becomes a man with a guitar and a locomotive too. And the iron rains to the hearth and the steel is blown blind in a further room and is rolled and drawn into these fine threads that hold the notes when the right hand touches them. So call it the wrong music or the wrong room or even the wrong part of town, but we know these geographies are melted and cast back again, light 
and music, which is mine because it is ours when the train passes by with its run out pulse and the blue flame rises over the county like the shirts we shoulder to keep the fire out and the shirts we button to keep the fire in. All right, I'm going to end with something kind of like a prayer. Um, my grandmother, who is thankfully still alive in her late 80s, taught me how to cook um, and tried her best to teach me not to cook like her mother cooked. As she says, the only thing you learned from your great-grandmother was how to make a mess. <laughs> like you can mess up every dish in, in the kitchen making something. And that's what she did too. Um, so I wrote this poem kind of for my grandmother, um, and it's called Grace. Uh, so it's sort of a poem for a meal. Because my grandmother made me the breakfast her mother made her. When I crack the eggs, pat the butter on the toast, and remember the bacon to cast iron, to fork, to plate, to tongue, my great-grandmother moves my hands to whisk, to spatula, to biscuit ring, and I move her hands too, making her mess. So the syllable of batter I'll find tomorrow beneath the fridge and the straw of salt and oil are all memorials, like the pan-fried chicken that whistles in the grease and the voice of my best friend's grandmother, like a midnight mockingbird. And the smoke from the grill is the smell of my father coming home from the furnace, and the tang of vinegar and char is the smell of Birmingham, the smell of coming home of history, redolent as the salt of black and white film when I unwrap the sandwich from the wax paper. The wax paper crackling like the cold grass along the Selma to Montgomery Road, like the foil that held Megger's, Megger Ever's last meal, a square of tin that is just the ghost of that barbecue I can imagine to my tongue when I stand at the pit with my brother and think of all the hands and mouths and breaths of air that sharpened this flavor and handed it down to us. I feel all those hands inside my hands when it's time to spread the table linen or lift a coffin rail. And when the smoke billows from the pit, I think of my uncle. I think of my uncle rising, not falling. When I raise the buttermilk and the cornmeal to the light before giving them to the skillet. And sometimes I say the recipe to the air. And sometimes I say his name or her name or her name. And sometimes I just set the table because meals are memorials that teach us how to move. History moves in us as we raise our voices and then our glasses to pour a little out for those who poured out everything for us. We pour ourselves for them so they can eat again. Thank you all. slice of East and Central Texas would make it the worst state in all of the states of the old Confederacy for, for lynchings. Well, uh, on the way back, Shannon finally said, why are we going this way? And I said, okay, um, it's this book I've been reading and we've silently gone through all these towns where many of these lynchings took place, you know, whistle stops you never heard of and college towns like Waco and Bryan and ground level zero for lynchings in Texas is Palestine, Texas, where on one day, there was something like 20, a mass lynching. And I said, I've I got to go look at the courthouse of this city, a uh, well, little town. And we pulled in, and I drove around the courthouse, and I was looking for something that would memorialize this awful day. 
And there was one historical marker, and I said, oh, that must be it. So I parked the car and, you know, trotted up onto the grass, you know, don't walk on the grass. And it was the historical marker that named the architect who had designed the, the, the school, the, the county courthouse, uh, the, the engineering firm that had built it, the legislator that had authorized it, the governor's administration. And there was not one word about what was one of the worst single days of racial violence in American right. history. And I stood there, you know, a middle-aged man in a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops, just wanting some kind of voice to come down from the skies and say, wait, this, this amnesia is not right. And I mean, I'm from Louisiana, and my hometown saw its share of racial violence, and so I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. But, it, you know, it made me think, Jake, your, your poem's giving voice to the voiceless, but how can you give voice to the anonymous? I mean, nobody knows who these 20 people were, or more, or even if that's the right number. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I don't... The list of names I have is 126 names, um, but I, I don't really use that number except in explaining how much work there is to do, in part because I know that list is a, is a partial list. It will always be a partial list. Um, I mean, lynching exist, existed um, in the way that white power has existed in order to erase the lives of people that didn't, didn't support white power. Um, and so there will always be something that is a race that you can never quite recover. Um, so the list is always a partial list. I have a little bit of the faith of somebody like Walter Benjamin, the, the philosopher who said, you know, nothing, uh, nothing is ever truly, truly lost because everything that happens leaves a mark in the world. And you may experience that or, or you may connect to it through a long series of, of tracings, but you can always get back to something. You just may not recognize it as such. Um, so that's why, I, I mean, that's part of why I do that work. And I know it's not going to be perfect, but I don't think that's the reason not to do it. I think that's the reason to do it even more seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? When did you develop this social <clears throat> conscience about civil rights movement and people involved? Was it through your family, your father? Was he a socialist with the steel workers. I know I've read some history of yeah. Alabama. Was it a good history? My father was, my father was a non-union uh, steel worker. So if anything, it would have been the opposite, right? Good history teacher. Yeah. Good history teacher, but also, um, I mean, really what did it for me was the fact that if you take Alabama history in high school as you have to, I imagine Texas is the same way, right? When you're in like eighth or ninth grade, you've got to take state history or something like that. They won't like tell that. us what really happened. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You learn certain things. So in Alabama history, you learn a lot of the, uh, you learn a lot of the Creek War. Creek War of 1813, 1814 is the um, western front of the War of 1812. And um, this is when Andrew Jackson, who would later be president, learned, um, well, he earned his fame. And he mostly earned it by going into Native American villages and burning them to the ground with the people still in the houses. And in fact, if you want a really macabre episode, uh, of history, read the read the uh, autobiography of Davy Crockett. He was at one of those battles, and he said after the, after it was over, they um, the soldiers dug up the salt cellars, and the potatoes had been cooked in the in the grease of the of the burning Choctaws, and they sat there and ate the potatoes. Okay, now that's something you're not going to hear in Alabama history, but you hear about the dates and you hear about the names, but no one ever shows you actually anything. Um, and I realized probably when I was in high school that one of the big battles, the Battle of Tallahassee Creek, um, was about 10 miles from where I grew up. 10 miles from where I grew up. And I started asking around. And it took me a couple years, but then I was able to, I was able to find somebody who had discovered where it was and took me there. And just like, as you said, with the courthouse, there's no marker. Somebody can take you there, and you can get there, but there's no marker. There's no kind of exercise of memory. And so I think in some ways what I do, even though it has a social consciousness to it, um, is actually a lot more about kind of connecting uh, these two worlds, which I think kind of lay on top of one another, to each other. One is a, a, almost like a world of story. And if somebody doesn't show you where that story hooks into the world the, of geography, of business, all that sort of stuff, then those two worlds 
remain separate in a kind of way. And I, want, I don't want that separation because I feel like that's this kind of thing that allows people to deceive other people. Um, people are always going to deceive other people. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not feeling like I'm going to get rid of lying or whatever. But we should, at least be, we should at least learn to be honest about the things that have happened in our names, in our communities, so that if we're going to, if we're going to live together, we know, what, we know what we're supporting. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can help me with a dilemma I face in my own work. Um, I do research into the Holocaust and the final solution. And I've written and researched mostly the perspective of perpetrators because, you know, I too uh, can identify with a bureaucratically and technologically organized uh, culture of Western society. But I refrained from writing about the victims because I just felt that. I'm ill-equipped to write authentically about the Jewish experience. And maybe you face the same dilemma in your work. Uh, how do you write authentically about a tragedy that many, perhaps most, would identify as uh, an African-American tragedy? Well, first I would say, I'm going to answer your question backwards. If people say to me, this is primarily an African-American tragedy, um, I say a lot of the victims were African-Americans and the, and the terror of the campaign I'm writing about uh, has definitely disproportionately affected uh, African Americans in the United States. But it's American history, and it, it was made with at least two races and, and with at least two communities. And you can try to write about it from one side and not think about the other side, but then if you're, in my case, I'm, I'm as white as a bag of flour, okay? Um, if I just write about what white people are doing, then I end up writing a lot about the killers and that sort of thing, and that's interesting to a certain extent. Um, but if that's all I do, there's not a place in the story I tell for the, for, the, for the white people who didn't kill anybody and who actually were trying to stop those things from happening or were then in the jury box and taking people to justice and that sort of thing. And those things also have to be a part of the story. Otherwise, the story that we tell about the Arab lynching about the era of Jim Crow, is really just a story about, about violence. It's really just a story about violence. And I think if we're telling these stories, um, we want to remember the violence, but we don't want to perpetuate the violence. We, I want to perforate it. And so in order to do that, I like to make those, make those connections and talk about those moments um, in what in the civil rights movement was called the beloved community, where regardless of what your racial background was, regardless of your family, your community, et cetera, you came together in the fight. And that's why I think, that's why I think we tell these stories. Yeah. In your research and doing these talks, do you or have you um, contact any of the family members prior to or after you've written the poetry? Subsequently, subsequently. I, I very deliberately don't try to go and talk to the family members at the beginning of the process, in part because I discovered I discovered early on before I knew exactly what I was doing that um, there is something interesting to be learned about what information is not available. You know, what, what would any person, like if I said a name to you and you decided to go out and research it yourself, what would you find? I wanted to see that first. What's at the courthouse? What's in the newspaper? That sort of thing. And so I didn't want to go into the process of writing about any one person with a lot of information up front. Because I wanted to see that. And that might not be the story, but at least now I've seen what the pattern of erasure or amnesia looks like. Um, and then sometimes I say, oh, this, is very this sort of thing is familiar to me. I've seen this before. I want to go a little further. And that may be when I would contact somebody if there was somebody to, be, to contact. Although what's happened more often than not is I write a I write a poem, and I know it's part of this larger project, and I may go back and revisit it later. Um, I'll publish it, and then a member of the family will actually get in touch with me. Yeah, that's happened a lot. Um, the one exception to that was I was I was a fellow at University of Mississippi a couple of years ago and working on some new poems, including this long poem about Medgar Evers. And a friend of mine who worked at Old Miss said, "What? Well, I, I know Merle Evers Williams, his his widow." And I'd like to show this to her. And so I sent it on, and I got back some, you know, some commentary from her that helped me kind of shape, shape the poem in the final, into its final shape. It just seems like things 
the families, the descendants actually, would be very grateful to you, as we all should be. So far, that's that's the kind of conversations I've had. I mean, maybe somebody's going to be angry about that. So far, I haven't had that conversation, that angry conversation. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Oh, Shannon, and then. Can you flip that around and just talk about your families? I know your family means a lot to you, and, and how important it is to you to have grown up in that loving atmosphere and environment. But what you said about your dad being a still worker. Um, my family's response to my work, well, it can basically be summarized by this tiny little story, and uh, and then I'll we can extrapolate from that if we want to. Um, when I was 19 years old and a freshman at Auburn University, I was supposed to be learning to be an architect. Uh, but I didn't really enjoy that work very much. And I one night went to a poetry reading which seemed to me about the, as opposite uh, of architecture as I could find. But while I was in the reading, what I became aware of was actually the architecture of, of the poems. So, oh, I can kind of figure out how that's put together. Like I can almost see it on the page even though I'm listening to it. And I thought, I want to do that. I want to do what I was doing in architecture, which is mostly cutting myself with small knives. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I went to inquire what it would take to change my major. It was so easy. I did it in five minutes. And then I called my parents. <laughs> I was like, my mom is a high school history teacher. And I said, she's going to she's gonna be into this. And my dad, who's a steel worker, is not going to be into this. And it was totally the opposite. My mom was worried that I was not going to be able to eat. And my father said this to me. He said, um, every day that I go to work is a day that I could die. And I want you not to have to deal with that. You should, you should have a, a job in which you don't have to die um, as, a, as a condition of your job. Um, so he said, go for it. And that's kind of my family's spirit um, is go for it. And there have been times, sure, when things have come up in my work that have made other people in our hometown uncomfortable. But generally speaking, um, the response has been, has been pretty good, you know? I mean, especially among the family, but then also among people that I don't even know very well, that I went to, I went to school with, or that were friends with my parents or something like that. So it's, it's been remarkably positive, I, I think. Yeah. All right, you, you had a question. I was just curious, in your opinion, as somebody who's doing what they can to make sure people don't forget about this time period, what do you think of books and movies like The Help that kind of take a really positive spin and maybe even the point of fictional spin on some of this as opposed to what you're doing? I don't know that The Help takes a positive spin on the story. Uh, I think, it's, I think it's trying to take a positive spin, but I, I personally feel like it ultimately, it ultimately fails. And the reason I feel like it ultimately fails is that it, I, I, think it, I think it valorizes certain people to the expense of other people who I think probably, had, well, I know had a lot more to risk uh, and a lot more to lose. Uh, and I feel like the way in which in the help, both in the book and the movie, the story of the white women, who of course are the focalizing characters, these are the people you're supposed to um, root for in the, in the world of story, right? Um, I think they end up obscuring the story that they're supposed to be kind of helping, you know? I mean, the generous read of that book is that the help signifies the women who come to clean the houses, but then the white women become the help to that movement. That's the most generous, sympathetic reading I can give to it. But I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely convinced by, by that work. So that's about the help. Your larger question is, What's, what's kind of the role of fiction um, in abetting that conversation? And I think, I think fiction, uh, and really all imaginative writing, I mean, to a certain extent, the poems that I write, although founded in research, are, are fictions. I mean, I'm, I'm creating something that didn't exist before. Um, all fiction teaches our brain how to think. It gives us a, sh a world or a mind that we can inhabit. And when that 
when the shape of that mind is a, a good shape, a positive shape, a salubrious shape, we become better people, I think. Um, and so if the help makes somebody look at something that they weren't going to look at before, then I wouldn't complain about it. I'm not going to read it again. Uh, I wouldn't complain about it. And for that matter, movies, you know, like Mississippi Burning, for example, which is, you know, not an entirely accurate depiction of those events, those sort of things are positive, are positive contributions to the conversation because they do point to things that kind of exist in a, in a silence. And to the extent that something looks at that and points to it and says, there's, there's something there that you haven't thought about, then we should have more of that. All right, are we, should we go out into the hallway now? So, yeah. thank you all.